must look over the time, Mr. Kelly. Here we have the um, Rocky, Rocky F, the international spokesperson for the West Africa campaign. He's based in the Netherlands. He's currently touring the Northern Asian countries for the uh, campaign ahead of the uh, MDP leaders meeting in Vanuatu next week. We also have the Chinese Supreme Leader for the Pacific Conference of Churches, Dr. James Bergman. He will speak on the work of the civil society organization. And before I give the time for our two speakers, I will ask Regino, who is representing the Young Solvana, to recite the call that has been put out last night. Also in the public space, social media, mainstream media. In response to the Pacific's solidarity support for West Papua, Indonesia diplomacy through aid and soft diplomacy, cultural, education, and sports to the Pacific is a clear response to counter the Pacific's growing political support for West Papua by directly targeting national governments, sub regional, and regional institutions. It has expanded its diplomatic relations beyond <coughs> to Micronesia and Polynesia, and has managed to influence regional policy spaces such as the Melanesian Spearhead Group, its MSG, and the Pacific Islands Forum. In 2014, was approved for its three groups from the single umbrella organization, the United Liberation Movement for West Papua. Mandating it to be the legitimate representative of the people of West Papua in the international arena. The ULMWP has since been elevating the issues and concerns affecting West Papua at all levels and have been building widespread recognition internationally. The ULMWP has also been seeking political recognition at the regional, sub regional space. Despite the fact of its legitimacy as a representative of the Melanesian people of West Papua, as well as a meeting, the required membership criteria, the ULMWP remains an observer in the MSG. By contrast, Indonesia, the colonizer, now holds associate member status. This travesty must be set right. The MSG leaders will be meeting soon. We therefore support the call of all the ULMWP and Vanuatu to bring West Papua back to the MSG family. We call on all our Melanesian leaders to grant ULMWP for full membership to the MSG and to also acknowledge ULMWP as the main political representative of the people of West Papua. This call reaffirms Pacific people's support for West Papua. Please join us in peaceful de uh, demonstrations, lobbying of respective MSG leaders, and submissions and social media posts. Thank you. So, good afternoon, uh, honorable members <coughs> of the media. So, as international spokesperson and in the region, to reconnect with uh, family in Indonesia, to emphasize the importance of the United Liberation Movement for Papua to become finally become full member of the Melanesian Spirit Group, as is one of the main reasons why the Melanesian Spirit Group was exist, uh, um, realized in the first place. And also to remember the leaders um, uh, of Melanesia to not forget this, this goal why Melanesia was exist to decolonize uh, the countries in Indonesia. At the same time, uh, Another call that we want to underline is that through the uh, acceptance of uh, the UMWP full membership, we acknowledge that the UMWP is the true representative of the indigenous people of West Papua, which clearly, geographically, ethnically, religiously, is not separate. You cannot separate that from the rest of the nation. This is a colonized mindset. I want to emphasize that as spokesperson. Not only for the US, but as 
question to the the current decision to have them and what happened what is happening in West Papua is clearly exposing the genocide and ecocide against the people of Papua. Another important one is that um, through this statement I want to underline the call of the Pacific Island Forum several years ago to welcome a United Nations uh, human rights fact planning mission to West Papua which Indonesia have been blocking since then. And where report after report is underlying the urgent situation happening today in West Papua with more than 100,000 internal displaced people and ongoing military operations against the indigenous people of West Papua. On 4th of July, uh, this month, the, a special advisor of the United Nations has once again underlined the genocidal situation against the indigenous people of West Papua. During the recent Universal Predator Review uh, by the UN, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and several other countries has also underlined the gross human rights violation in West Papua, which Indonesia is not tabling it internationally nor in the Melanesian Spirit Group, where they are associated now. This is against the principle and the spirit of the Melanesian Spirit Group. So, this is an element that I want to encourage all people in Melanesia will carry it uh, like the people in Europe are carrying and standing, standing in solidarity with the people in Ukraine. This spirit, this solidarity is something the Melanesian leaders should take note of. They should do the same for their family. That's what I'm hoping for because in every conversation I had, I went to Solomon Islands, to Vanuatu, and now I'm here to Fiji to speak directly to our family here, to no longer look away from the atrocity which Indonesia is committing <coughs> to the people in the top, in the family. So when they are associate member, and we have no voice, or how a less voice as observer member within the Melanesian spirit, this is an unequal position. So at least give us the opportunity to speak on behalf of, of ourselves when the leaders are not willing, for whatever reason. We respect that. But at least give us a voice as even equal to Indonesia to table the issues that concerns not only to the people in West Papua, but which is in the interest of all the people in Melanesia and the Pacific, because we are the guardians of the world's largest tropical island, the third largest tropical island, in the middle of a clamp of biodiversity crisis. What happens there is fully in the interest of the entire region and the world. So my call here would be that we acknowledge UNWP as true representatives of the people, indigenous people in West Papua, that we acknowledge the human rights violations which are happening in our backyard against our family members. And that we, as Melanesian leaders, do not forget why Melanesian spirit group was, is existing in the first place. And if we acknowledge that, look at what Europe is doing for the people in Ukraine, and all the reports which are building up, we have a moral and ethical responsibility. And I strongly believe in all the conversations I had last week that the people will do the right thing. That's why we have a great spirit of a one box. And I'm hoping the spirits of our ancestors will bless the leaders with the same knowledge and responsibility. Thank you. 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 Thank or you, want, you may be wondering why we're sitting here doing this press conference, this big conference of churches in Ojo. The churches of Papua, members of the ECC since their inception in 1961, the four largest churches, indigenous churches in Papua, are members of the Pacific Conference of Churches and also form the West Papua Council of Churches. And through them and their endorsement of the ULMWP, uh, PCC, and uh, civil society worked and were part of the process of the formation of the ULMWP. So I speak on behalf of the regional civil society community, the people of the Pacific, to reiterate our support for the ULMWP as the representative, the political representative representative of the people of Tana Papua or West Papua into this, this conversation. 
And, you know, we talk a lot about Melanesian family values, Melanesian spirit, Melanesian brotherhood and sisterhood. <laughs> you can perhaps imagine then what it must be like for one of the family members to be left out of the table when the family sits down. And to have Indonesia sitting there at the table while Papua is only able to observe what is going on. The whole purpose of the UNMWP being a member of MSG is to facilitate the dialogue between the people of Papua who are facing a lot of oppression and the Indonesian government. That was the understanding by the leaders of the MSG. So we, we look at that issue and continue to affirm the call for full membership of the UNMWP. Um, uh, Brother Raki referred to uh, 2019 reminder by our Pacific leaders to Indonesia to invite and to have the her special rapporteur on human rights from the UN to come and visit Papua. That invitation was made and then rescinded. And, and this is a reminder to us, particularly not just for the MSG, but for the Pacific Island countries of pretty much the last words of uh, the late Kohiva, Prime Minister of Tonga, who during our civil society dialogue at the Pacific Island Leaders Forum meeting in Tuvalu, in tears, challenged the Pacific leaders and Pacific countries on what they meant by regional solidarity. He said, how can we talk about regional solidarity when one of our brothers and sister countries, one of our people is suffering? And so this is the question then that we are raising. How can we talk about Melanesian unity if one of our Melanesian sister and brothers is left out in the cold? When we talk about unity and solidarity, we talk about being willing to embrace. And civil society has already recognized the UNMWP as a representative of the people of Papua. And so what we are asking is for our states, the people that we have elected, to recognize this call by the people who elected them to ensure that the UNMWP gets a seat at the table as a full member. This is our Pacific way. This is our Melanesian way. And so this is very important at this day and age as we move forward that we get this at a time where thousands of people today, this morning, are standing on the streets in uh, uh, Wamena, in Jayapura, where else are they? Manakwari, in the different cities and towns of Papua, standing with signs like this to give us full membership in the MSG. They are calling, holding the Fiji flag, they are holding the Vanuatu flag, the Solomon flag, saying, we are your brothers, we are your sisters. They have their face and their body colored with the flags of our countries. And they are looking to Melanesia to stand up for them. And we are calling for that to happen. And so you, your role is very important because you are here to tell this story. You are here to be part of that history where once again, our leaders will be judged on their actions. <coughs> so we reaffirm the role of the ULMWP and we reaffirm our call for their full membership of the nation spirit. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you for the question. Now, me personally, not a spokesperson, my task is more uh, directed to the grassroots and also to the media to introduce. Uh, but it's up to the leadership, and I think uh, Interim President Daddy Brenda had, had a conversation 
in a meeting with uh, Prime Minister Abuka in April, I not uh, I corrected, and that became a turning point as well because uh, the Prime Minister, new Prime Minister of Fiji, has shown his support for this full membership, which is endorsing the others to have another uh, um, attitude as well. And I'm 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 calling on probably William Salon Islands to reconsider their position. So um, I think in the recent days, um, I don't know for sure, but the, the leadership is once again having a meeting with the government in Fiji, but I cannot confirm that. My task is more focused on the grassroots. What are some of the challenges that uh, the organization faces in trying to, I guess, rally up the support of leaders in the region, especially given that uh, a lot of these Southern Asian countries have uh, uh, trade partnerships with uh, um, countries, countries like uh, Indonesia. Um, I was just looking at those stats, and uh, in 2021, um, Fiji and the trade uh, value between Fiji and um, Indonesia was well about uh, 60 million dollars, Fijian dollars. So, <coughs> how do you um, try and leverage your call for good governance um, in a climate where a lot of these leaders have to consider that aspect of? Partnership yeah, that's a good and interesting question. Of course, that's uh, it's always a challenge for us because we don't have those resources to compete with Indonesia. I don't know how we know that these resources are coming from the immense rich West Papua. We have the world's largest gold mine sector. So the resources are that Indonesia is using to build economic relationship with countries in Indonesia uh, is basically paid with our blood, with the blood of our people. At the same time, there, there, there is this reality that countries build this economic ties, uh, that Indonesia is ex exploiting that opportunity to buy off political support for uh, the people of Papua. That's what we've seen. So how do we compete with that? That's, that's the, the question here. Is, you know, just exposing the truth here. Well, you know, the leaders are, you know, building economic relationships and trade with Indonesia, which is needed to, for the economy to feed the people. At the same time, we're hoping yeah, to realize that through these relationships, the injustice will continue to be there in West Papua against the family members of the family. So what I bring forward is imagine what will happen to the people in Ukraine since the entire world is exposing rightly what is happening there, that the West would not supporting the people in Ukraine, but they will make trade with Russia. That would be strange, right? That's exactly what has happened in the last 60 years against the people in West Papua. And also by the Malaysian Pacific. And this is the mirror that I wanted to reflect. That while they're speaking rightfully against for the people in Ukraine at UN General Assembly, but are denying the same moral obligations for the people in West Papua. This, this is against the spirit of Melanesia, against the spirit of the Pacific. And this is something that I only can tell directly to the people to ask their representatives to have that same attitude towards the people in West Papua. Understanding that whatever money agreement you make with Indonesia is paid by the most, the richest province of Indonesia, West Papua. So the challenge is there, but I'm confident because we have seen that the government change right in Fiji is there. It's a matter of willingness. Is it possible? Yes, that's how we've ended slavery. That's how we've ended apartheid. By the leaders who have this obligation of moral responsibility. So my task is to emphasize this obligation, whether it is from pristine point of view, indigenous point of view, um, this is the right cause. And as long as we talk about it, like the West is doing it every single day for the people in Ukraine, I'm expecting the same as thing happening right here, that the media, US members of the media, but also the civil society, which we are doing here, to be that voice for the voices. That's the way forward. And that's how we build momentum the last things. And I'm hopeful, but the challenge is we have lack of resources and Indonesia has an abundance to buy away that. So the challenge is how are we speak to them? And it's about just telling the truth. And we are winning hearts and minds by the day, as long as we are continuously telling the story about injustice that Indonesia do. And they will lose it. It doesn't matter how much billions they spend on lies, that lie will never become true. The truth is on our side, international laws on our side. The facts on our side, the only thing we have to do is expose it. And that's my task. I'm really confident. And Reverend James, uh, a 
PGRC and under uh, political governance uh, in the last 16 years, which uh, we saw a change in December of last year, but the fight for to free West Papua has been an ongoing uh, fight of civil society. And in the past six months, this colonial government has come in. Uh, what has been the difference uh, from your perspective? I just said, like, maybe there's a slight change in governments, uh, in the government's ability to put its political muscle towards um, supporting this cause. I think what we uh, uh, we have seen over the last um, seven months now uh, is a willingness to engage with civil society, a willingness to listen to the issues as we raise them, uh, particularly on the issue of West Papua. And if you look back over the last 16 years, when these uh, those who are in government now were in opposition, they made commitments regarding Papua. The very people now who are in government used to stand with us at our flag raising ceremonies, just like you know, with our flag, when we fly the Morning Star flag. Um, they marched with us, they walked with us um, over the last um, the last 16 years, and particularly since uh, the solidarity movement in Fiji took uh, gave, was, was given birth in, in 2015. Um, and so we are encouraged by what we hear. We are encouraged by uh, what we see. And all we seek now is for Fiji to take, uh, take leadership in this, in this space. You know, in the uh, 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent, and this week they've been having discussions on implementing the 2050 strategy, there is a, um, um, one of the areas is peace and security. And what we are talking about are issues of peace and security. We are talking about thousands of women and children who are internally displaced because of what is happening in Papua, because of the resources and the land grabs that are taking place. And my brother here has spoken about the very same resources used for trade with, with Melanesia and the Pacific. These resources come from those places. And so this is about justice and solidarity. We cannot talk about solidarity. We cannot talk about either Melanesian solidarity or Pacific regionalism without thanks to the suffering of the people of Papua. And it's a very small but significant step is to give the UNWP a seat at the table as a forum. Uh, as I said earlier, civil society, churches, not just here, but in Papua, everyone is saying, give them a seat. So all they have to do is just meet and say yes and welcome. The uh, first prime minister of Vanuatu made a very important statement. He said, uh, we cannot say Melanesia and the Pacific is free until Papua is free, until Kanaki is free. And one of the original members of the uh, Melanesian Spear Group, and still today, the FOMKS, is a liberation movement for Kanaki. So how can you have one liberation movement at the table and exclude others because it was the same conversation and it still is today so this is a very important time for melanesia for fiji uh, and for the other countries in Melanesia to step up and, and, and listen to what the people of melanesia are saying reverend um sarah from islands business um my question to you is um i know that uh, west papua's churches is also part of pcc and um, I'm hoping to uh, learn a little bit more or hear a little bit more of what's, what's the voices on the ground uh, from West Papua in terms of what are they going through, their sufferings or if they're, because um, we've, we've, we've seen images, we've seen videos, I uh, would really like to hear what they are going through or if you've received any feedback from the churches. I've asked the West Papua what his people are going through, but yeah. what we have received from the the, the churches, particularly the four churches that are members of, of uh, PCC and together from <laughs> the West Papua Council of Churches, we receive regular updates from them. They are telling us about uh, the human rights abuses that are taking place. They are telling us about um, the way in which people are being displaced, as I shared earlier, about people being killed, including church workers. Yeah. So 
We are hearing stories about civilians getting killed and displaced. We are hearing stories about people who were trying to collect money for Cyclone Winston, Cyclone Yasa relief in Papua for their Melanesian brothers and sisters in Fiji being beaten and arrested. So it, it's not just the, uh, 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 the oppression of those standing up for independence or self-determination. Anyone who tries to gather is being victimized. And so even when our, our people from Papua are trying to do something for us, they are, they are beaten, they are arrested. We know very well what happened in, uh, in 2019 with the whole, uh, uh, you know, this racism really coming out around uh, the, the call of West Papuans as monkeys. So we are seeing very strong, uh, very clear acts of racism, of the abuse of human rights. And that's why the call by Pacific Island Forum countries for Indonesia as someone who wants to be on the UN Human Rights Council, who wants to be in the UN Security Council, if they really want to be a member of the international community and have some respect, they need to open up to this. So a very simple thing is for them to allow the human rights rapporteurs to come in and do their own independent investigations of these uh, so-called allegations which we receive reports about. And I think that's a very important thing for us to, to remember that for Pacific Island countries, that is a key thing. While sovereignty continues to be a contentious issue, what we are talking about is people suffering every day. Can you add something to that? Yeah. I think this is a really important question. So what's the situation on the ground? So I lost my father. Arnold Up, who was a famous anthropologist and musician, four months before I was born. He was assassinated by the mutineers. There was the reason that we, we and my mom, my three brothers, fled to the neighboring Papua New Guinea. I was born a year later, we fled to the Netherlands. This story is just one of the more than 500,000 stories. Imagine that in a total of less than 2.1 million indigenous West Papuans, 500,000 is almost a quarter of the people. Imagine a quarter of the people in Fiji were murdered in the last 60 years. And the entire region, the media are silent about it, and they make profit out of the genocide. And the rest of the people in Fiji who are living knows, every one of them knows a family member who have been assassinated, or whose wife has been raped, children being murdered, up to this day. Becoming a minority in your own country, living as most poor citizens, knowing that you're the richest country on the planet. Who would accept that? This is the pain that we get for much to come. And this is why I'm confident, because when we feel this pain that I felt my entire life, after more than 500,000 West Papua family members feel the same pain, if every Fijian or Malaysian will feel this pain, they will remember what colonization means. And they will help us. They will give us at least a voice. That's all we ask. Just a voice to table these issues that Indonesia has to try to keep away by a political support. That's what we do. Just want the people to know the truth through the pain that we feel every single day. That's what we do. Um, gentlemen, you've spoken at length about, about the, um, the lack of action and the hypocrisy by the leaders in the Pacific. What about um, actions and sort of the uh, attention from international from international organizations and NGOs internationally. Are they concerned about the gross violations of um, human rights in West Papua? That's a good question. So we see a clear turning point here. That's why I'm so optimistic as a spokesperson. The moment I've started as 16 year old, I'm 38 now, from deadly silence then to a more coverage globally. I'm based in the Netherlands, which is the former colonizer of West Papua. West Papua have been kept away from the history books, out of the curriculums, out of the media. So people were just, you know, not informed. So we can't blame them. So this is the role that the media should play. Looking at before the war in Ukraine, nobody in the Netherlands cared about the people in Ukraine. Now you see flags everywhere. Why? Because 
even NGOs, media, politics, everybody's talking about every day in the newspaper, which is not in the case of us public. So people do not aware what's happening there, so they can't have a feel of empathy. So this is the challenge that we are faced. But what we have done with campaigning, basically storytelling, and what we're doing today, informing the public, then they will be reactive. So the Dutch Parliament has finally been in this motion, putting the motion, calling for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Christian Mosman. This is historical. We got more than seven countries, including the US, Australia, highlighting the last, last universal pedagogy on Indonesia, in Geneva, about these human rights atrocities, that they should be accountable. We're seeing the Pacific Island Forum starting to table issues. So yes, there's a clear line of awareness. Are we there yet? No, of course not. Because we don't got 1% support, whether it is media, money, diplomacy, political like the people in Ukraine is getting. So we are far away from where we want to be. But this is the challenge we face. As long as people are silent, institutions can look away. That's what the Netherlands have done. So the challenge is telling the story, raising awareness, and then we see institutions following the same line. So I'm hopeful because the line is going up, but there's still a lot to be done. And that's why I'm glad to stand here, young Sora, and kind of comes to churches to inform you once again, in the hope that we got the same support, empathy, like the people in Ukraine at some point. 60 years ago, there was a gross injustice done to the Ottawa people. The UN system itself failed. This is one very small but significant step in correcting that injustice. Uh, we, we can see countries stepping up outside of the Pacific. We can see the parliamentarians, activists, very strongly in support. Even the World Council of Churches at its last uh, assembly in Germany last year issued a minute on Papua, West Papua, raising the issues and talking about the information that they have received and their concerns. And so this is something that uh, is not just a Pacific issue, it is a global issue. But we have seen in the past, uh, as Rocky has uh, referred to, we've seen the changes that have taken place in South Africa. And we see the support for Ukraine. We need exactly the same because the, this is no different unless of course it's because these are people who have darker skin right and there is more to be gained by supporting the oppressor and the colonizer in terms of the resources that they are extracting at the cost of the people suffering and so this is not only a political issue it's an economic issue it's also an ecological issue uh, as uh, uh, Raki has raised in terms of uh, of the rainforest and climate change. And so this is something I think that, that really we need to, to listen more about, to discuss more. And, uh, you know, it is my hope that, uh, particularly for all of you who are gathered here today, that this issue needs to be front and center for one thing. Perhaps it was in the generation before you, but certainly in the last generation has been lost a little bit and we need to to get these stories back up to the people. Thank you. Uh, there's a final question. I understand that the Dutch government is uh, as before trying to engage in how much of a role how significant is their role now uh, in the fight to the US Papua? That's a good question. Yeah, their role can be quite significant. As former colonizer, it is their signature between the Netherlands and Indonesia without any consultation of the West Papuans during the act of correction during the New York Agreement in 1960, where the Sufrani Transit the Supreme Court became effective. So they have a moral obligation to be a voice once again, profiling themselves. This is why we are campaigning fully in the Netherlands. The government of the Netherlands is profiling the city of The Hague as international capital of peace and justice, with the International Court of Justice and many, many other UN institutions. They could keep that bold position as long as this story become not their story. Because as soon as people find out what the Netherlands have done, and that's what our campaign has shown, exposes, there's a double standard here. You're exposing hypocrisy, big hypocrisy, that you have ignored the right of self-determination to fulfill it. 
as was promised right there in the early 60s. <laughs> okay, we had a first government, the Lubini Council. We had a national anthem, a popular voluntary court. It was all in place in 1961. How? Because of geopolitics, the US in front, the UN facilitated. A right to self determination was denied on the international. This makes it complex how they are involved in this fraud, international fraud. So the challenge is to bring this double standard up. That's what we do. And they feel that's why they are now changing. We got this momentum in the Dutch parliament, reactivating, bringing British people back on the agenda. That's the way forward. And we've done that by educating the people in the Netherlands, getting news articles, getting universities. I'm giving guest lectures on many places. The environmental movement to highlight what's happening on the world's largest tropical islands. That makes that they couldn't ignore it for, for anymore. This is the way forward. So at some point, when people are talking about it, the politics can be ignored anymore, and this double standard <coughs> exposes itself. And that's what makes me so optimistic. Having the opportunity to inform you, and that you inform the public, and they, Australia can inform every single day what is happening in Ukraine, which is right. But being silent about the genocide on the doorstep, ABC has a responsibility. This is like double standard. And this is the only thing what we can do, arm ourselves by exposing these double standards. And that's the way forward. And that's how we can put West Papua back on the agenda as well in the Netherlands, here in the Melanesian Spirit Group, in the Pacific Islands Forum at the UN. As long as we continue to tell the story. That's the way forward.